Well, hello everyone, once again. Uh, it is now, now time for our uh, plenary lecture of this afternoon. And uh, we have, uh, I have, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Peter Spufford uh, for this end of the afternoon. Um, I'm going just to very briefly talk about, well, something that probably most of you already know, which is who he is and a little bit about his life work. And um, born in 1934, yes. <laughs> Professor Spuffer did his undergraduate stu studies and graduate studies also at Jesus College in Cambridge uh, from 1953 to 1960, if I'm not mistaken from the information I saw. Yes. <laughs> before moving to the University of Kiel in Staffordshire, where he taught from 1960 to 1979. On that year, he moved to uh, Cambridge and became Queen's College Fellow. And until 2001, he was successfully reader in economic history and professor of European history in Cambridge, and also president of the Cambridge University Heraldic and Genealogical Society. In 1959-1960, uh, academic year, and I think, according to the information that I saw on Wikipedia, he remains vice president of that society. Yes. <laughs> so the Wikipedia is absolutely correct. I must look at myself. You should. <laughs> Emeritus since 2001, he has been visiting professor at uh, very prestigious European universities in Leuven, for example, in Belgium, at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study. And he's also a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London, and fellow of the British Academy. Professor Spuffer's curriculum is very long, uh, but extremely coherent. If you decide to take a quick look at his publications, you'll see that the keywords such as money, currency, mints, and financial markets immediately emerge, revealing some of his main research topics of the last decade. Although you also find research on the origins of the English Parliament in 1969, and more recently on materials for the textile industries in pre-modern Europe, published in 2015. Many of these works became instant classics and uh, are used today by scholars and students all over the world. I am thinking, for example, about Professor Spuffer's Monetary Problems and Policies in Burgundian Netherlands, 1433-1496, published in Leiden in 1970, the Handbook of Medieval Exchange, published in London in 1986, the quintessential money and its use uh, in medieval Europe, published in Cambridge in 1988, or, for example, the remarkable power and profit, the merchant in medieval Europe, published in London in 2002. He was also one of the eight members of the editorial board of the new Cambridge Medieval History. <laughs> So That's surely not in Wikipedia. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Probably it is. So, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm greatly honored to have Professor Scoffer here in Lisbon for this conference. So, please join me in welcoming for this lecture, Money, Power and Profit. As you can see, I am now an old man, and I, am mar I am, think it marvelous to be invited here by the two universities and for Flavio to have done the arrangements for me, and I am very grateful to be here. What I'm going to do now is an old-fashioned lecture with words, no pictures, no PowerPoint, <laughs> and I hope you have all had a lot of coffee to keep awake <laughs> to hear me talking in a foreign language for all this time, because I am very conscious that I cannot give it in Portuguese or even in Castilian or Catalan or any other sort of Iberian language. And I know there are other Iberian languages as well. <laughs> yes, to go back to what he has just said, um, as an undergraduate in Cambridge, I started the University Genealogical Society 
and then later on I merged the genealogical society with the heraldic society and created the University Heraldic and Genealogical Society <laughs> and they made, they made me a perpetual vice president of it. <laughs> uh, but that is just on the side. Um, I do other things on the side as well, but that is, uh, it was very surprising to hear. Um, I was hooked on coins as a schoolboy and started the Bath and Bristol Numismatic Society um, as, and I was secretary of that, and then as an undergraduate they used me as the editor of the yearbook for the uh, British um, gathering of numismatic societies throughout the country. So already by 1956, when I began my research with Philip Grierson um, in Cambridge and Hans von Verwecker in Ghent, on money in the 15th century Burgundian Netherlands, I had already uh, published things as both as a schoolboy and as an undergraduate. But whilst in Belgium, to do research in the archives there for that PhD, and my PhD took forever because I did other things on the side, I met uh, Emile Luce who was then a professor at the Undivided University of Louvain-Leuven. He was a charismatic scholar, and his key book, L'Ancien Régime, was about the representative institutions of medieval Europe. He was the president of the International Commission on the History of Representative and Parliamentary Institutions, and persuaded me that this was much more interesting than money. So I wrote... In the, uh, I wrote first on the interest of representative institutions in the Netherlands on um, coinage as sideways from my thesis and then I wrote on representative institutions in Europe um, in their interests in coinage. And I gave a paper on that at the International Historical Congress in Vienna in 1965. When I gave that lecture, two men popped up at the end and said, I nearly gave that lecture. <laughs> one, one of them was Stanislav Rusotsky from Warsaw, and the other was Tom Bisson, who was then at Berkeley. So we all said to each other, what are you going to do next? And we all said, I am going to write about medieval representative institutions, putting them in the context, their social context. And none of us did. We all ran away to different things. Uh, Vin Blockmans has done that sort of thing, but not me, and not Stanislas Rosotsky, and not Tom Bisson. So we all ran away. What should I do um, instead? Well, uh, the next thing I had to do uh, was to organize the International Commission on Representative Institutions meeting in London, um, getting meetings set up in the Houses of Parliament and all that sort of stuff. So I was stuck just for a moment uh, with power at the top levels of Cortes and princes. However, earlier in 1963, I had done a chapter on coinage for the Cambridge Economic History of Europe uh, instead of Philip Grierson. Philip Grierson said he wasn't happy with what he'd written. I looked at it afterwards and it was better than what I put in, but never mind. <laughs> but he didn't write about money, he wrote about coinage. And I suspect what the economic historians wanted was about money. And in fact, I had, it was liked by the history editor at the Cambridge University Press who said, would I write a little book on money for medieval money, which turns into money in its use? Just a little book, they said. 
but I was probably preoccupied with parliaments and power at that point and didn't do it at all. But when I had to put it aside, put parliaments aside, because I knew I couldn't do it if somebody else was doing it, um, it was there to pick up. Uh, at the time, as you've heard, I was teaching history at University of Kiel, and I had to do everything. I had to do political history, economic history, social history, cultural history, religious history. So it was easily possible to turn from being a political historian writing about parliaments. My first book, as you said already, uh, was actually on the origins of the English parliament, not my thesis, which um, I already had a university lectureship before I came back to my thesis. <laughs> And even when I had done my thesis, I still didn't publish it because I was tied up with thinking about other things. Until Philip Grierson said, why didn't I publish my thesis? The examiners said, publish it as a book. So in fact, it comes out rather late. But in 1969-70, I had a visiting fellowship at Clare Hall, which was then a new postgraduate college in Cambridge. And I spent the whole year reading in the Cambridge University Library, with occasional forays to what was then the British Museum Library. Um, and it was clear that the CUP's idea of a small book was a nonsense. And it wasn't a, a one-year project. It was a 15-year project. And other things happened on the side with it. So, for example, when uh, Michael Poston asked me to do the original chapter for the Cambridge Economic History, he said, could I put in a little appendix with the exchange, principal exchange rates of medieval Europe? That in itself was a whole volume um, which I was able to resume in money in its use uh, in a few pages. But it had to be written, the whole book had to be written first. And that was an interesting project because what I did was I got money from our uh, Social Science Research Council, as it was then called, and um, employed a research assistant who worked through all sorts of long theories. I talked to Raymond de Rover uh, before that, and Raymond de Rover said, don't do what I did. I intended to do this before the war, but I never did, because I got waylaid by working in archives. And you know his things, perhaps, on Bruges, Barcelona, Bruges, Florence, uh, using Dottini material. And he, at the time of his death, he was doing um, Paris, uh, Florence. But that never happened. So he said, um, don't do that. Concentrate on what has been put into print. So I had a research assistant who, with me, trawled through all the, um, this, all the series of periodicals that we could possibly think of and produced a duplicated version first, which we sent off 200 copies all over Europe. And then people wrote back and said, but you haven't used this, you haven't used that. And so I then had another research assistant, and we put together the Handbook of Medieval Exchange. But that was on the side. It was a, a precursor of doing the money book. The problem with doing the money book was that since uh, quite early in the 19th century, people had write, written about the money of their own country. People hadn't looked at Europe as a whole. So I had to read intensively and try and pick out what was common. I mean, for Frenchmen, the medieval West is France. And that's all. <laughs> if you are a Venetian, Venice is the most important place in the world. You don't really look outside. Even if you come from somewhere small like Luxembourg, you could fit with the Low Countries or you could fit with the Rhineland. It's much better to think just about Luxembourg. So I had to do a huge amount of reading and, of course, 
uh, that hasn't stopped. Um, today we have been thinking most heavily and very properly about Portugal, but Portugal and its place in first Europe and then in the wider world. But quite often people have written not looking outside. It's a bit like that since I wrote. Favier and Le Goff still think of France as everything. I, uh, Ladero Casada has written about Castilian things, and I don't think he's written, he's written an enormous amount about Castilian things, but I don't think he's really written much outside Castile. Um, Cecilia von Heine uh, on Sweden, Gulbeck on Norway, Goldthwaite on Florence, who's been quoted already today, um, Muller on Venice. So, uh, once again, one has a problem of a whole um, putting it together. And what I had to do was to make patterns um, for the whole of Western Europe. I, I had to limit myself to Western Europe for perfectly simple linguistic reasons. I never managed to ma master any Slav languages or Greek, so I couldn't, didn't cope with Byzantium except it second hand or with the Slav world. Um, but I managed to find that I could cope with most um, Romance and Germanic languages, some with difficulties and lots of dictionaries. And also, of course, I was thinking in different terms from numismatist. I was thinking about money, not just about coin. Though a lot of what I wrote was about coin, but coin was only one aspect. For the early Middle Ages, and in some cases right through the Middle Ages, people were paying not with coin, but with weights of silver. Um, when Mark, we had a, a mark of silver as a weight, um, could be paid in coin, could be paid in a bar of silver, it could be paid in broken metal, it could be made in a, a cup made exactly to weigh a mark, and of course you have 60 or so different marks scattered across Europe. Payment in, and you get, as well as coins stamped, you get marked bars stamped with authorization from particular places. So, for example, um, the proper way to send money in the 13th century from uh, Belgium, the Low Countries, Flanders, to England was in bars which had been stamped in Bruges. Not coin, but in bars stamped in Bruges. You melt coin down, make it into bars, send it across to England and turn it into, back into coin again. Or not. And you, as well as having um, bars of a mark, you obviously in Eastern Europe you have things which weigh a ruble or a grivna um, or somi, which go right on to the end of the Middle Ages. But for most of the Middle Ages, that sort of payment, which is so useful for buying land or for buying rights to land or for large purchases, uh, is replaced with gold. And then, of course, um, at the last century of the Middle Ages, one has both the... Um, banking at a local local level uh, with money changer bankers um, whom we take for granted when, for the later Middle Ages, though I haven't heard anybody talk about uh, what there was in the way of money changers here in Portugal, though I imagine people will know about that, but though I don't happen to know about it myself. Uh, and there are some countries like England which did not have um, money changers who were able to turn into bankers because the state did the money changing uh, and 
would not al did not allow anybody. But in other places, you had in fiefed money changes, sometimes money changes tied to mints, sometimes licensed money changes, heavily regulated, sometimes very lightly regulated, and you had this sort of thing. Um, being enormously important for coinless payments. Coinless payments become more and more important and by the end of the Middle Ages um, in the principal cities of Europe much is made without any coin except at the end point. And as well as the money changes you also have the um, Merchants, and it is merchants who run bills of exchange. There are not, there's no specialist in bills of exchange. It is, um, they are still merchants, and that sort of use of the word merchant for bills, for, um, for people who run bills of exchange really runs right on into the 18th century without any specialists. So, again, and you also have tying in at the end of the Middle Ages. Um, people who uh, ran a local um, bank and you paid in your bill of exchange to the local bank and you didn't actually use coin. So we have a Picamelio, for example, something like 7% of the money is turned into cash, all the rest, another 93%, is just changed when it arrives into um, accounts in the local banks. So this extraordinary difference, so that is the money market is multiplies coin. Uh, when one has a lot of coin, you get lots of credit easily. When you, you have a shrinkage of coin, you have problems about um, producing that sort of thing. Now, coin. When things have changed in the amount of information, money in its use came out 30 years ago and it was translated into Spanish fairly soon and has never been translated into any other languages. Into Castilian Spanish, I should say, I suppose. Um, Lots has happened to the more, I think, has happened in the 30 years since money and its use that has happened in the dozen or so years since um, the trade book. The trade book is still a relatively new book. Um, the money book is an old book. So, for example, when I began in 1969 getting the material together for the money book, uh, metal detecting was effectively limited to military and industrial uses um, for such purposes as post-war mine clearance and that sort of thing. By the time that I sent my finished text to the Cambridge University Press, amateur detecting as a hobby, which had begun in the 1970s, was still in its infancy. In the 30 years since then, it has become very widespread, and in countries where it is legal and recorded, it has been incredibly useful to tell us about things. For periods uh, before the 13th century, when mint accounts begin, I had relied heavily on the evidence of coin hoards. But the number of coin hoards has expanded quite extraordinarily. So, for example, uh, yes, when I was writing, um, the list of known hoards of Carolingian coins was that in Morrison and Grundtvall's, then standard work on Carolingian coin. This included 59 hoards of three or more Carolingian coins. Eighteen years later, that's after my book was published, Jean Gest Duplessis was able to list 87 hordes, an average of an extra one every year. Twenty-six years later, Simon Cooke listed 200, 
80 hordes, uh, an average of over two extra hordes a year from France alone. Only three years later, he was able to list an additional 26 hordes in just three years. Uh, four months ago, he wrote, uh, incidentally, to show you the speed of fines coming in, I published a supplement to the hoard list last year, an additional hoard from three years' research, but now already have another 23 hoards to add after just one year. <laughs> In the last four years, um, as many new hoards have been found of Carolingian coins, as nearly as many as were altogether known when I wrote. And that is just one bit of it. Uh, if I, I have other examples, uh, no, I'll forget other examples, but um, uh, coins from Arab Spain in Provence, or coins in Bornholm, or, yes, hordes just multiply like anything. But as well as that, something else, single finds of coins. I mean, most of the things that people turn up are what I've got in my pocket. These are three coins from my own village. Here's one small village. I've got here a, a halfpenny of Edward I, a two a twopenny piece of Edward IV, uh, and a. Uh, yes, and also some th oh, penny of Queen Elizabeth from one small village, and that has happening everywhere. And these I are on my way to take into the Fitzwilliam Museum, where they will be put in a database. And the same sort of thing is happening in Scandinavia, in the Netherlands, in Germany, everywhere where it is legal, and even in Belgium where it is totally illegal. <laughs> local numismatic societies record these things without, as it were, being <laughs> letting people be open um, to persecution. And this gives us a different picture. Hordes are what people have deliberately concealed and they generally tend to be good and better. Single coins are what people have lost. You find vast numbers fallen in marketplaces. You find the occasional gold coin. We know far more about um, circulation of gold in Western Europe now just out of, that is pre um, 14th century just out of what has been found. So that is something totally different. Uh, metal detecting has totally changed our knowledge of the coin element of money. The other thing that has started to change the uh, coin element of money is an idea of my old supervisor Philip Grierson which he had in the 1980s. He was then a man in his 70s. And he said, the standard work on medieval European coinage is now 100 years old. It's time to replace it. Yes, it will take about 13 volumes, he said. It's actually going to take about 15, 16 volumes. Um, and we said, but you're in your 70s. Oh, he said, that's all right. My family live till their 90s. I have 20 years. <laughs> that should be enough. <laughs> uh, during his lifetime, he did live to his 90s, during his lifetime, two volumes came out, but he wrote part of all the others. And now a whole team of people are producing such volumes. Uh, here in Iberia, um, doctors uh, Cruzafont and Balaguer have produced one for the Iberian Peninsula, 
which gives one a totally different picture. They have settled to, to bring together all that has been published over the past century or so and make a coherent whole. And this is going to be a fantastic resource for people all over Europe when it is completed. At some point when it is completed, because each of these things has something, uh, quite a lot on the politics, because that was Philip Grierson's interest, so you have a political background to everything that happens, and a little bit of the economic um, background as well. But when that whole series is completed, um, you want somebody will be able to sit down and make a new money in its use uh, with a much more um, solid base than what I did. Because even though I did the best I could, I was still being, to a certain extent, impressionistic, um, working across the whole of Europe, a little bit here, a little bit there, uh, and not able to do it as coherently as medieval European coinage. Now, in my coinage part of my money and its use, I did quite a lot on where metal came from at various periods. And mining is obviously vitally important. Mining here, for example, there's not precious metal mining, or didn't, I don't know about any worthwhile precious metal mining in Portugal. There is some in Spain, but primarily it comes from other places. Uh, England is the same. We have little bits here and there, but nothing significant. So I made a chronology um, of the legacy of Rome, running down into gold triens, and then somewhere, we don't know where yet, um, in the uh, late 7th century, early 8th century, there's a sudden burst of silver coin, the beginning of penny coinages throughout Western Europe, and we don't know where that silver came, comes from. Then, um, we do know um, about the mines at Mel in, in Poitou. Um, and we also know about Asiatic coin coming in in exchange for slaves from Western Europe through Scandinavia into Western Europe. We know about mining in the Hartz Mountains near around Goslar. Um, and we know that there's a lack of coin um, in the first half of the 12th century and then a succession of silver mines being opened up in various parts of Europe in the 1160s, 70s onwards to the 1250s all these are silver mines and if one wants gold uh, gold is coming in from West Africa which we know quite a lot about um, coming into uh, Sicily, Iberian Peninsula and to a certain extent um, East African gold coming into Egypt, which I didn't talk about in my money book, but I should have done. East African gold, which is really um, Indian Ocean gold, uh, some comes up to Egypt and from Egypt to Venice at one particular point in time. And then one has a what is called a bullion famine, but it's really a silver famine, there is because gold is quite prolific by that point. In the 20 years around 1400, then the Bosnian, Sil um, Bosnian and Serb silver, then another bullion famine, and 20 years around 1450, and then from 1460 is a huge new lot of weight. So I was able to make a time span for the quantity of coin, because there is a perpetual imbalance of trade outwards from Europe which carries out silver or gold, whatever is available, um, either through the Mediterranean or through the Baltic. Um, the Hanseatics buy more furs than they, set them, than they sell anything from the West. The 
Mediterranean, the Italian, North Italians, the people from Barcelona, um, buy more spices and oriental products than they send out. And so there's a perpetual drain, and it needs to be restored and restored and restored by mining. But that was 30 years ago. Now, one of the things that people may look at is by the man called Blanchard. I don't know whether Blanchard is a meaning of Ian Blanchard in Scotland, who's written a big volume on mining, minting. He was broader than I was. Um, he did look at East African gold. Um, he did uh, look at copper mining, lead mining, uh, and so forth, in conjunction with mining of silver. Unfortunately, he is not safe to use, which is very sad because he did so much work. But for example, in this first surge of silver, which brings us the beginnings of the pennies in the 670s and so on, um, he supposed that the mines must be in England. He had an obsession for getting silver mines into England of importance. He thought they were in Devon. Well, what is perfectly clear, clear is such um, penny coins, skeets, as, come in, as are used in England, come across the North Sea. And from the new evidence we have, the quantities are quite enormous. Um, Yes, so for example, Michael Metcalf writing recently in um, the Dutch numismatic publication have shown that between 695 and 720 in Friesland, in the far north of the present Netherlands, some 20 million pennies were produced in those years, and another 10 million in the region at the right mouths of the Meers and the Rhine. And the following 20 years, they were guessing that some 7 million more were minted in Friesland and some 30 million in the mouths of the Great Rivers. In other words, they are saying that uh, something like 70 million coins were, pennies were minted in that area alone. They don't know where it came from. They also believe there is somewhere and they were su suggesting that it is somewhere um, up the Rhine or the Meuse because there is at the same time a huge increase in Frankish coins um, as well. And in fact, I think it's probably from that, somewhere in that area, rather than for Mel in Western France, that uh, what becomes available in the Carolingian period, uh, the, in the Ninth century, one has these polyptic, ecclesiastical polyptics from the, um, what is effectively the, the Frisian Provence corridor, which talk about um, free tenants paying rent in cash rather than in kind. And that comes from we don't know where. So, um, and in the period when there is little coin in England, I'm afraid that Blanchard um, assumes that there was an enormous production in northern England. There are certainly tiny min mines, silver mines there, but it makes no impact at all on general European coinage. So, um, yes, that has changed and is changing all the time um, when one talks about the, co the coinage background and even little bits that I put in like for example the period of renovatio moneta which is the regular recoinage of coin of recoinage um, as a means of taxation so let us say uh, you have a recoinage and Last year's four coins are brought in and you're given three new ones which look different 
and the only ones you are allowed to use are the new ones. And uh, what well, the difference is a form of taxation to cities, to principalities, and so forth. And I knew a lot about that in Anglo-Saxon England, and I knew a lot about that in Germany uh, rather later. But we now know it happens here in Portugal, which I didn't know until very recently. It happens in southern Italy. Uh, the earliest is not in Anglo-Saxon England, but in Normandy. Um, Muscard from Denmark has pinned it down to a date quite early in the 10th century in Normandy, uh, which obviously will fit into England uh, across the Channel. It will fit to southern Italy, and it probably fits even down here. Um, so Renovatio works as a form of taxation at a point in time when in a locality you have enough coin for it to be worth doing, but not so much coin that it becomes impossible to do. It works at that interim stage of monetization. Uh, if you have a lot of coin, you can't bring it all in, because if you bring it in every six or seven years, it is jolly effective and it brings it all in. If you try and be greedy as a ruler and do it every few months, every six months, it doesn't work, uh, is one of the things that's quite clear. And one of the things um, that comes out of that is that when you are doing this, you have a coherent money supply for that limited area. You don't use foreign coin at that moment of a recoinage. Then, of course, it seeps in from one area to another. So what is normal later because after a point, people are fed up with this form of taxation and they like um, something instead, a monetagium, they would call it in Normandy, for example. And many of these are, in fact, hearth taxes. They are a form of direct, a different form of direct taxation. So that is something different. And that works uh, particularly with more money about. More money about. In a period, an early period, when it has basically penny coinages and occasional halfpenny coinages and coins cut in halves and quarters to make them smaller, it is only really in the 13th century that you get are known as grossy big pieces and small pieces, piccoli. Um, and it is in the late Middle Ages you have a question, who has money? At the top level, strangely, you have large quantities of money in the hands of uh, noblemen who, have, who don't, uh, but also Noblemen and great ecclesiastics are both the biggest hoarders of money, but also the biggest debtors. Uh, they're both, if they manage things well, they are very well off. Uh, then you have your people who are money changers, who have to have a stock of money, and if they act as bankers for other people, they have their money in there, or a proportion of it. A proportion of it. Uh, 13th century regulations in Venice say something like 10% has to be kept all the time. Uh, they also say you can have money on a deposit account or on a, uh, a current account. Current account you don't um, get any interest on. Your deposit account in Venice, you have to have it on deposit for two years to go because the banker is going to put the money into uh, a trade voyage from Venice to the uh, Middle East, around to um, Flanders and back again before. So in other words, you need a two-year run to make it work. So money changer bankers. Then the people in the middle. No, not the people in the middle. 
the urban proletariat, if you can call them that, that's a very wicked word to use, um, the urban um, inhabitants who are using money all the time. They are the people who have a lot of money. But what they have is small money. And one is aware of Piccoli, or what one likes to call this small money, turning into more black money, and eventually actually real copper. So, 30 years ago, I wrote that official copper coinage returned to Western Europe in 1472, with the Cavalli minted in Naples, followed by the Bagatini next year in Venice. I expressed my surprise it hadn't happened in the mid-15th century silver coinage. Although I pointed out the Venetians had discussed the possibility during the silver famine in 1463. However, in Scotland, the, the copper coinage of the 1460s was then thought of as made by Bishop Kennedy. Now we know it is Scottish royal coinage, so that takes it back another decade. During the Civil War, also 1462, John II of Aragon uh, gave 13 cities in Catalonia the right to mint dinar for their local circulation. These were made of pure copper. However, go back a generation earlier, uh, Jürgen Stein Jensen has pointed out that King Eric VII of Denmark minted copper sterlings around 1422. Here in Portugal, the pure proper Real Preto was being minted by King John I here from 1422 onwards, having previously produced a Real Branco, which was so black, it had one grain fine, one 288th part of silver. So, I, 30 years ago, I said that black money struck in the East and Low Countries was pretty awful, but we now know that the bishops of Liège minted in pure copper, going back to the um, dreadful John of Bavaria at the beginning of the uh, 15th century. Bishop from elect from 1389 to 1418. He's a dreadful man, but that's by the way. But um, it's very recent that um, somebody of pure copper with little bits of zinc and lead and tin, but no silver at all, and then he thought he would analyse some ones further back. And the ones he could get hold of took him back to John of Bavaria. So at the moment, at the moment, we think the copper coin begins in the West sometime in the first years of the 15th century under John of Bavaria in Liège. But tomorrow we may be able to push it further back. This is something which is changing all the time. Copper coin, uh, which is strangely other. Now, an idea which is new, and is, I think, not much in print yet, is Jan Lukasen, um, recently retired from the Institute um, for Social History in Amsterdam, who is writing on deep monetization and the payment of wages. Deep monetization. What he means by deep monetization is having enough small coin for those people in towns who are relying on wage labor and buying loaves of bread, vegetables brought in from the countryside and so forth. Deep monetization. When have you got to a situation when you can do that? And he uh, uses as a, a reckoning um, deep monetization defined as substantial per capita 
availability of small coin equal to five and ten times the prevailing hourly wage consisting of denominations equaling the value of one hour or less of waged work. So deep monetization. Now when does it start? And he has jumped about all across Eurasia, uh, showing it I think probably at its earliest in China, and in Western Europe he picks out oddly uh, England in the 13th century, he puts it at 1282 and I would put it earlier than that because what he hasn't taken into account is the fact that earlier in 13th century England we were using uh, pennies cut into halves and quarters um, which he hasn't taken into account. So deep monetization is something which you are going to hear about, I think, a great deal more um, over the centuries. Now, money supply. I've talked about mines. I've talked a little bit about trade running outside. I'm not going to talk about mints, uh, which was another ancillary thing that I had to do. Um, one of the things that um, I used to give an impressionistic feel um, of um, what was happening, what was used where, and so forth, are merchants' notebooks. And you are probably conscious of things like Pegalotti's notebook or the Dark Canal notebook, which are um, easily available. Um, there are more than I thought. Um, myself and Alan Stahl, we intended to do this using material gathered by Alan Evans before the war from all over Europe, but it, we never did, and Lucia Travaini in Italy has done a, a book made up of them. But when I last counted, there were 17, this is in 2010, there were 17 published, so it's not just Pegalotti and Darkenau, 17 published such notebooks, sometimes called merchants' manuals, but they're really notebooks. Um, and um, 11 not then published, I don't know whether any have been published in the last six years, but the ones that I then knew about um, are mostly Italian, but not entirely. There's a Venetian one in Acre, Pisa, Venice, Genoa, Florence, Venice, Barcelona, Seville, um, Majorca, Valencia, Nuremberg, Marseille, Genoa, Bruges, Florence, 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 London, and the unpublished ones that I was aware of. Uh, are mostly Italian, uh, almost entirely Florentine, but also uh, Genoese, um, Languedoc, Augsburg. But these are notebooks gathered together by merchants of what is, they think, useful information. Now, the trouble with using them is that they don't tell you what date they're talking about. So you go to a place and you gather together your information, which is useful for now, and you put in a little bit about the past. So you find the Champagne Fairs in notebooks long after the Champagne Fairs don't exist. So there's a problem about how to use them. But nevertheless, they still give you a lovely impressionistic feel. Now, um, as well as the, um, the money book, as it were, be needing to be horribly updated over 30 years, uh, the um, exchange rate volume that went with it um, also needs to be updated um, 
there is an online version, not updatable, not yet updated, um, in uh, Rutgers, where you can look at it, as well as buying copies, uh, which I think are quite cheap second-hand because it was produced to all the members of the Royal Historical Society, uh, many of whom are political historians who think they didn't need it until they suddenly have realized they do, <laughs> um, or people who are talking about pictures being sent from Italy to the Low Countries. What does it mean when it's, you paid so much here? or you send a sketch to the north from Italy to have a tapestry made. What does it mean when it's in Florence, uh, Flor uh, uh, Flemish money if it's going to be used in Italy? And a great deal more has been done. The man Marcus Denzel has done a handbook of world exchange rates which is really post what I did. There is a great gap, really, for much of the 16th century. Though some of that has been done by Oliver Falkert, and I would love to have uh, the time, the money from a uh, big grant to do a new edition of that, money, that exchange rate book, because that is out of date. Now, the book that people have been talking about today um, follows on automatically from my money book because in my money book as well as the political changes and which for example a big political thing is the Crusades and the Crusades take huge amounts of money from the West to the Holy Land uh, people talk about the advantages of the Crusades, but the advantages are negligible compared with the amount of money that went out of Europe for them. Most of my things are not about politics. Most of my things were about money moving about either as paper or as bars or as coin in trade terms. So the money, the book you've been looking at heavily today was my response to what is the other side of that? And, as I have noticed today, um, people have picked up on the demand side of it, the emphasis that I put on capital and court, and I was delighted um, the empire of things, uh, uh, Richard Goldsworth's way of talking about it, I was delighted to notice um, that Flavio talked about um, Alfonso III, having a permanent court in Lisbon. And what he didn't say, but I imagine some of you know, is did the nobility as well as the administration come and have houses in Lisbon? So there is there a market uh, which is important in itself? Uh, Casti uh, the problem of the Castilian Federation of States, Leon and um, Castile and so on and so forth, and it's, it's that it didn't have a single centre. It had a number of different centres until Philip II, which is um, very odd and different. So I use Paris as a paradigm, and I think one can say that uh, Lisbon is a small Paris just in the same way as London is a small Paris for these purposes. So this is a, um, I noticed coming back to Portugal, um, there's a high proportion of land was in the hands of the royal family, which meant that it's not an enormous amount of uh, land in the hands of great ecclesiastics and other noblemen, and therefore the substantial demand is made by the royal family and also uh, by the religious orders. I mean, such as there is ecclesiastical land is in the hands of religious orders. And that is where your demand is being made. So there is your pri th That was one of the things. Another thing that I brought out in the, that book, which ha people haven't talked about, is physical infrastructure. I talked about the 13th century 
um, being marked by road building, by um, river dredging, by bridge building. Um, the rivers were made navigable, navigable like the Po and the Arno. What about the Tapas and the Douro? Bridges came across the road. But what about bridges across the Tacus and the Douro? I've been so shown the Salazar Bridge here. <laughs> but the Salazar Bridge is not what I was thinking about. How far upstream do you have to go to go southwards um, across the Tagus? You had Roman roads with Roman settlements. And I saw little bits of Roman settlement yesterday in the cloister of the cathedral. Well, you had Roman roads, but were they kept up? And how were they kept up? Um, that sort of infrastructure. Um, river mouth harbours. Um, you obviously did have here and in Porto and in Viana. Um, like Porto Pisano at the mouth of the Arno. Um, but what was done quite deliberately, or outports in some parts of, of Europe, like Enfleur, Arfleur, at the mouth of the Say. What you'd be more talking about is the uh, methods of doing business um, being transferred across. Uh, the one bit of that that you didn't talk about was a mail service. Um, the mail service I noted um, coming out from the Tuscan, well, no, coming out in the hands of a few great firms in the 13th and early 14th century, and after the bankruptcies of the 1340s, you have a set of services set up by towns, or rather city-states, like Florence, Lucca, Siena, Milan, Venice, um, which ran all the way from there up in one direction to Bruges, in another direction around the coast of the Western Mediterranean to Barcelona, and then across Spain as far as here. Um, letters need to be sent regularly. If you're going to use bills of exchange, you have to have somebody to send them. I know people used other um, things like diplomatic couriers and um, religious couriers, but nevertheless, the prime thing is you had to have it. And I have no idea whether from the, the, whether the Portuguese crown set up courier services or not. Um, does anything survive, um, or is this something you have lost? Uh, and I was astonished as well um, by what people have been saying is about the lack of exchange rate material here, though I gather more is coming up. Uh, but particularly, I was expecting to be able to find a more of exchange rate material um, of sending money to the papacy. Um, but I didn't find any when I was doing it, and I think more can be found now. One of the things I also did was to think about the scale of trade in different parts of Europe. And I did not give any idea of trade in the Indian Ocean, just knew it was much bigger than in the Mediterranean. Um, somebody at some point must try and do that comparison. But Mediterranean trade against Baltic trade, I got the impression that in the end of the Middle Ages, Mediterranean trade was about ten times as large as in the Baltic. We know so much about Hanseatic trade because so many recent diligent Germans have published so much. Um, North Sea trade, I would guess, could come somewhere in between uh, about a third of Mediterranean trade and three times Baltic trade. But where do um, these ports, Seville, Lisbon, Porto, La Coruña, um, the Basque ports, um, fit together? Uh, are they dealing in the quantity of Mediterranean trade, the quantity of North Sea trade? What scale? Um, is a question that I was asked, asking myself when I was listening to what people were talking about. 
I also heard, of course, what one's talking about um, trade, about re-export. I was astonished and delighted to hear about um, Irish hides being sent to Italy by way of Lisbon along with Portuguese hides. And one has lots of that sort of thing. So, for example, Bruges is the main centre of the fur trade, which is brought by Hanseatics um, from the Baltic and then redistributed. It's re-exporting. And I suppose um, things like uh, Baltic brain um, coming to... Uh, Bruges, Antwerp, and then being re-exported to here. And I was um, delighted to hear about the Bretons being involved in the grain trade. I knew about um, then what periodization do we have for where trade was. When I was first looking, um, I looked at a triangle of tr land trade which was so important in the immediate point of the commercial revolution of the long 13th century between uh, northern Italy attached to the Levant by water uh, and the mining areas of Central Europe and the Low Countries. And then one has the move to going around, um, around here um, to get there by sea. And then one has the problem of piracy in the Mediterranean and the breakdown of sea trade there, but its survival here and the return to land trade. The land route from Venice to Antwerp uh, revives um, in an extraordinary way. And one has, over time, changes and we know I think much more from all these little detailed studies um, about it and we heard today about piracy in the English Channel um, not merely uh, piracy in the Mediterranean and that obviously makes people feel more comfortable with trading by land and so for example um, the Fuggers don't necessarily use shipping to get from uh, South Germany into Spain. They go overland, um, just as they do between to Venice and Amsterdam. And what I'm looking at now is financial centers, because that follows on from asking myself about trade. I'm looking at places where people come from and where they go to. Brodel just put put all financial centres into one patent. Um, I don't think he's right. I think that financial centres um, are of different sorts. If one thinks in the 20th, 21st century, as we are now, I still am a 20th century man. Um, um, one has London as a key world financial centre, but if one looks at London, the people who work there are not British. They come from all over the world, lots of them American. Um, and one can say, if one liked, that out of Chicago, New York, Boston, uh, they are financial centres from which people come, and London is one to which people go. If I were trying to do the same um, early on, I would say that Florence and Genoa are places from which people come. Venice is a place to which people go. Venice enormously international. Now that's not saying that the Venetians don't go out by sea. They don't go out in any, any other way. The Fondaco dei Tedeschi, as it were, has a monopoly of what goes north by land. The Venetians don't do that. The Milanese go north but the Venetians don't. Um, Venice is a place to which people come. And I get the impression of what we've been hearing today, that Lisbon is a place to which people come, like Seville, like Bruges. Uh, and what I know from 
what we've heard in the past and again today, Burgos is a place from which people come, not to which people go. I get the impression, I may be wrong, that there's hardly anybody except Burgolaises in Burgos who are doing all these things. I don't think they're outsiders, or if they are outsiders, they are uh, Sephardic Jews who have been so long in the place that they are really count as natives. I think your Bernoulli are one of those family. Uh, so, that is where I go next, if I live long enough, and go on having energy. Now, I have in front of me some books about what is happening next. There's a volume just come out on marine insurance, uh, which is obviously part of my financial centres. And uh, I was asked to do a thing at the end of it. And what I noticed was that it did not have anything about Rouen or anything about Bourgos, two places which are, I thought, highly relevant. Uh, and practically nothing about Hamburg. But Rouen, so in other words, even a brand new thing, which is a survey of marine insurance starting um, from Genoa and other Italian places at the beginning and running through to the French Revolutionary period, doesn't encompass everything. But nevertheless, it gives one some ideas. Uh, and what it doesn't say is what I wanted to point out to them, because there's a chapter in there about the English in America to say that the first um, insurance raid in, made in America was not in Philadelphia, but in Mexico and in Bahia at almost the same time as in Philadelphia. So in fact, this is an Anglo-centric set of things, and in fact quite a lot of the people involved have worked in the City of London. Another thing which makes one think uh, on a wider level is this book um, edited uh, called Explaining Monetary and Financial Innovation, a Historical Analysis. And it runs from ancient Egypt to Mesopotamia up to the euro bond. Uh, it is very poor on the Middle Ages. It jumps effectively from Rome to the Renaissance. Uh, and you may criticize it, but nevertheless, it gives you a sudden look at different things. A lack of continuity of banking um, from, the Middle a from Rome to the uh, late Middle Ages, but nevertheless, there are all sorts of precursors that are fun to look at. And more things new uh, for, no for Northern Europe, a new book by Gaspar and Gulbeck, Money and the Church in Medieval Europe, 1000 to 1200. It's not Medieval Europe, it's Medieval Northern Europe. And another book, Money and Finance in Central Europe during the later Middle Ages, which is heavily uh, focused on Bohemia since it came out in Prague. But yes, we are in something where everything is changing, and I have been delighted here today to hear all sorts of things that I'd never heard before, which are new things happening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this a long time. <laughs> brilliant presentation, uh, which uh, took us through several different stages, not only of your uh, research, but also your life and career, yes. and the making of those books, the stories behind them, <laughs> the people involved, the yes. difficulties you faced. And, uh, and now, and, and the funny thing was, I was thinking in the end, not only you, were you um, uh, presenting as a beautiful lecture about money, currency, minting, and all sorts of things, but then in the end you were asking us questions. Yes. Well, I thought this was the other way around. We asked you questions. <laughs> but yes. you invited us, and you created, you, you talked about problems, um, and you spiced things up for us to, you gave us a food for thought. Of course. Yes, so, but you are not going to answer. No, 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 of course not. <laughs>
In fact, the discussion that follows this uh, lecture is to uh, take advantage of uh, you being here in order to ask you questions about yes. uh, these topics that you presented. Um, so we'll now open the floor for some uh, brief questions. Yes. Stefania. Um, well, thank you. I'm actually very interested in this last thing you said and And that there are some places that are some important, that are sort of broad in attracting people. And of course, this is something which is required. I mean, Venice as well as Flanders work as centers of humiliation. But people need to be, <coughs> if they want to do something in trade and, and finance. And on the other way around, of course, that places like Google and other centers tend to be places actually giving people merchandise and, and, and capital. So I'm very interested in this uh, last thing you said. So there are some attractive goals around the Europe that actually change you know, in a period of time. Of course. Uh, this is the actually, uh, okay, this, this was a comment with the question. So yes. it is actually very a, a nice example of things changing over time is the way that at one stage Florence is only a place which sends people out and then gradually it starts to live on its past and people come in. We have had your Borgoleses having a consulate in Florence. We have other people setting up in Livorno which succeeds Porto Pisano as the port of Tuscany. Uh, people are, Florence changes from a place from which people go to which people go. Instead of Florentines in London, you have Englishmen in Florence. More questions or comments? Near the end of your uh, talk, you, you said something about Brodel. So, what is what you were saying is you do not agree with Brodel's approach of these financial centers falling upon each other. This is yes, because um, uh, because what Brodel didn't reckon was that there were ones which were poles from which people came and those to which they came. He just made a list of financial centers without differentiating what they were. Uh, as a young man, as a student, I was made to read La Méditerranée, which was then a new book in French, and I was overwhelmed by it. And later on, of course, I met Brodel, who was a fantastic man. But what he had was the ability to make huge generalizations, and then particularities to pin them down. And that is something which I have tried to follow, but haven't always managed. But he was fantastic. I'm sorry, there was something you said on the side which is uh, particularly important for there aren't many, but there are something like six or seven uh, postgraduate students and uh, even undergraduate students. I think it's important uh, the pedagogical part you gave us about how careers are set in stone from the beginning. No. They are something organic, composite, which we uh, grow into and may want to change halfway. But that all that experience in the end combines in order to make us a little uh, richer as historians because of all those fields that we had to cover, teaching your, um, um, your description of how teaching all sorts of medieval history helped you to have a proper vision, uh, combines with the, what you told us about how your career shifted, although around the same thing, but uh, looking at it from different perspectives and enriching what we see from those different perspectives. And I think that's very good for people who are starting or in the process of becoming uh, more um, uh, more qualified historians. Although um, 
this is a process that never ends, and thank you for that uh, testimony. It is a process which probably reaches its high point immediately after retirement, yes. <laughs> uh, when one has all this experience built up and one has the opportunity and good health. I am astonished by two men, no, one man and one woman, who on retirement said, Finis, because it is normally the time which is the most lavish opportunity. Somebody like Wim Blockmans, whom I gather is going to be in Portugal next week, um, is just at that point in time when he has built up and has the time and the opportunity and the energy to do things such as I had actually at the point when um, the trade book came out. That was my, what I did at that point in energy and now I'm doing other things more slowly and I don't know whether I shall ever write the financial centres book uh, because in one's 80s one can't tell anything. But yes, you're quite right, the, the thing changes over time. And there's a, the other interesting thing is, I mean, one starts doing things, if one's going to be uh, interesting as an undergraduate, and then as a research student, then as a postdoc, and one hopes one gets some sort of tenured position. I was lucky, um, though in Cambridge I put in for an assistant lectureship as the short-term lectureships were then called, and a man in his 40s got it, and I was in my 20s, and I said, I'm not waiting 20 years, which is why I went away to Kiel. Uh, one has to adjust the way the reality is. But the other thing that happens to people in their 40s, there is a mid-career, 40s, early 50s perhaps, a mid-career thing, and you say, am I doing the right thing? And I thought about doing all sorts of other things, like turn into a turn into a publisher, turn into running uh, a large charitable trust, going into politics. But in fact, all I did was change university. <laughs> <laughs> but people, um, there is a point in the middle like that. So yes, there's a, a whole. And some of the people who, in fact, in the marine insurance people, are people who have spent the first half of their time actually in the city of London, involved in insurance, and then at half time they have come to universities and done doctorates and are now doing this sort of thing, academic historians, and having built up a nice competent bulk of money from the city and therefore they are not dependent upon grants in the way that normal academics are. Well, good. I don't know if anyone else wants to... No. Or, Mario? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you talked uh, about the, the notion of books, and you said that uh, those are sources that uh, we can have a lot of confidence with them. They are still, they're useful pointers, but they are not something you can rely on absolutely because right. the problem is you don't know what date they're talking about. I think you can believe what they say as having been true at some point, but you don't know whether it is true at the point when the material is gathered. Because, for example, Pegalotti's notebook which was combined whilst he was working for the Bardi um, which up to about uh, 1340. Um, what we have is a copy of a copy of a copy from quite late in the 15th century. In other words, some young man starting out on his career uh, copied an old notebook of somebody else. And one has just that element. Um, in these other notebooks, how much are they copied from earlier notebooks? So yes, uh, I think one can treat, one can say what they say has been true at some point, but you can't say when. Yeah, um, I was thinking about this too, and I 
Uh, I think that uh, we should regard these notebooks more as, uh, I don't know if it's, it's, it's well said in English, uh, more than starting points, arriving points. So, for example, for example, when Luca Pacioli wrote about the double entry, oh, yes. everyone knew about double entry, so it didn't start with him. It's some uh, kind of writing. Uh, yes, to... he was just a marvellous publicist. Yes. Uh, and actually, there's a point when merchant notebooks do get replaced by something which is a manual. Uh, somewhere in one of the um, Studio del Abaco in Florence, there is a production in the 15th century of a stand what becomes to be the standard uh, book which then gets used and printed as soon as one gets to printing. Uh, and then, of course, it gets copied and transformed um, in the Low Countries and so on and so forth. And again, um, Denzel and co. have worked on what happens later in the way of these things. Well, good. I think uh, we have no comments and questions. Once again, many thanks for this uh, marvelous lecture, for your patience as answering our questions <laughs> and doubts, of course. And once again, a uh, round of applause for Professor Peter Spuckel. Many thanks. And you have just heard a 20th century lecture. I stood up and didn't <laughs> use PowerPoint. <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, our works continue tomorrow morning. We'll visit the National Archives, the uh, Tour de Tombe, at 10. And then in the afternoon, we'll travel to Porto to continue these uh, money, power, and profit conferences uh, Thursday and Friday. Uh, we'll discuss that in. Well, thank you.